that strengthened these three patriarchs to hold on to a foreign land and not to return to Ur of the Chaldeans? What helped them to endure the alien land of Canaan and 215 years altogether? It was their faith, their faith in Jehovah God, and then the reliability of his unbreakable promise. To this effect we read at Hebrews, the 11th chapter, 9, 10, 13, and 16. By faith, he, Abraham, resided as an alien in the land of the promise, as in a far land, and dwelt in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the very same promise. For he was awaiting a city having real foundations, the builder and maker of which city is God. In faith all of these died, although they did not get the fulfillment of the promise, but they saw them afar off and welcomed them and publicly declared that they were strangers and temporary residents in the land. For those who say such things give evidence that they are earnestly seeking a place of their own, and yet, if they had indeed kept remembering the place from which they had gone forth, they would have had opportunity to return. But now, they are reaching out for a better place, that is, one belonging to heaven. Hence God is not ashamed of them to be called upon as their God, for he has made a city ready for them. Abraham, as an example, and his son Isaac, his grandson Jacob, was determined to die abroad rather than to shrink back from his assignment and return to his native city Ur of the Chaldeans. That pagan city, being in the land of Shinar, Abraham even made himself an unwelcome person there in that neighborhood because he pursued and put to route four Confederate kings from that area. These were Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, the king of Eleazar, and uh, Kader Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim. Abraham and his troops despoiled those kings and all the valuable things and captives that they had seized during their invasion in the land of Canaan. No longer did Abraham want Ur of the Chaldeans as his residential city. He renounced he preferred to live as a nomad in the promised land, deserving something better than an idolatrous, sinful city of his birth. Rather than be a man-made city, rather than a man-made city, Abraham, as well as Isaac and Jacob, wanted a city or government of which his God is the builder and maker. The foundations of Ur of the Chaldeans lie in ruin today, but not so God's city. For Abraham's faithfulness till death, Jehovah God promised him not a heavenly inheritance, but an earthly one, the land of Canaan. So at his resurrection from the dead, Abraham will be raised to life on earth. But at that time, the earth will be under the absolute rule of the city that belonging to heaven. The messianic kingdom of Abraham is most important descendant, namely Jesus Christ. Abraham was an excellent example of faith to this glorious descendant, the one through whom God's promise to Abraham is fulfilled, for Jesus Christ is outstanding, and he is the seed of Abraham, in whom all the nations of the earth will procure a never-ending blessing. To 
spiritually speaking, Abraham is said to be the father of the disciples of Jesus Christ. No matter whether these have been taken from among circumcised Jews or from among uncircumcised non-Jews, the Gentiles. On this point, we read the following from Genesis. And he, Abraham, received a sign years after his becoming a wandering alien in the land of Canaan, namely circumcision, as a seal of the righteousness by the faith he had while in his uncircumcised state until he begot Isaac, that he might be the father of all those having faith while in uncircumcision as a Gentile in order for righteousness to be counted to them and a father to the circumcised offspring not only to those who adhere to circumcision that is circumcised Jews but also to those who walk orderly in the footsteps of that faith while in the uncircumcised state as Gentiles, with faith, our father Abraham had. Now because Abraham became like a spiritual father to the disciples of his natural descendants, Jesus Christ, Abraham was used as a type of Jehovah God, who is the Heavenly Father, of all the seed by means of whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Thus Jehovah God is the greater Abraham. From him comes the quality of faith because he gives his Holy Spirit to those who worship him, one of the fruits of the Spirit producing being faith. His dependable faithfulness to his promises inspires faith within us towards him. Far more so than Abraham, Jehovah is the father of the faithful ones or of those having faith. By holding fast to such faith we shall, like Abraham, enter into fulfillment of God's promises to us. Our faith will aid us to endure until we get the things promised by God. Abraham is indeed an example to us today who look forward to the wonderful things promised to us by the God who does not lie. At present, we still have men and women who in a figurative way are persons without a country. These are the ones who really have the faith of Abraham. They are the dedicated, baptized disciples of Jesus Christ, the principal one of the seed of Abraham. It is from no wrong standpoint that they are looked upon as a people without a country. This standpoint is backed up by what one of Christ's disciples, the Apostle Peter, wrote in his first letter addressed to those who are called the temporary residents scattered about in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. In what sense were these Christians temporary residents? This is shown in chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, where the Apostle Peter writes, 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, Beloved, I exhort you as aliens and temporary residents to keep abstaining from fleshly desires, which are the very ones that carry on conflict against the soul. Maintain your conduct fine among the nations, or the Gentiles, that in the thing in which they are speaking against you as evildoers, they may as a result of your fine works of which they are eyewitnesses, glorify God in the day of his inspection. Aliens, we dedicated disciples of Christ, may be in the world. But how consoling it is to know that we are not aliens to God. To him, 
we are no longer alienated and enemies because our own minds are on the works that were wicked. We do not walk as the nations also walk in an unprofitableness of the mind. While they are in darkness mentally and alienated from the life that belongs to God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the insensibility of their hearts. The Apostle Peter and the anointed Christians of his day expected to move out of the worldly system of things in the day of their death and thus no longer be aliens sojourners or temporary residences in it. But today, in this 20th century of Christian congregations, those of the Jehovah's Christian Witnesses who survived the oncoming Great Tribulation, will not move out of the system. Why not? Because this wicked system of things will itself be removed from the face of the earth in the war of the great day of God the Almighty in which the tribulation will end. Do we really profess to be dedicated Christians? Well then, are we conducting ourselves as aliens and temporary residents among the worldly nations in a way advised by the inspired Apostle Peter? There is a solid reason why he exhorted Christians who have been given a new birth to a living hope that they should carefully conduct themselves as persons in a foreign land. The reason for their doing this was that, as Peter said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for special possession that you should declare abroad the excellencies of the one that called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. For you were once not a people, but you are now God's people. Obviously then, such ones are no longer a part of this world that is alienated from God. They are no longer walking in its darkness, but are light bearers from God. They are in a situation like that of Abraham long ago. Their hope is not that of this world. Their hope is one inspired by God's promise. This promise is now nearing fulfillment, glorious realization. More than 19 centuries ago, Peter penned the words, there are new heavens and a new earth that we are awaiting according to his promise. And in these, righteousness is to dwell. Hence, beloved ones, since you are awaiting these things, do your utmost to be found finally by him spotless and unblemished and in peace. Those new heavens where uh, the city that faithful Abraham awaited so patiently, a heavenly government, having real foundations for builder and maker, which is the city of God. The new earth is a new human society made up of all those who procure a blessing through the spiritual seed of Abraham. Since Christians are aliens and temporary residents, and as such, are awaiting the fulfillment of such a divine promise, how could they really interest themselves in the political affairs and violent conflicts of worldly nations? If their hearts are truly set on the new heavens and the new earth in connection with God's kingdom, they sincerely could not do so. Jesus Christ said to his disciples, our Heavenly Father knows you need all these material things. Keep on then seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness. Such a seeking of the Heavenly Father's kingdom first would include ones taking an active part in the carrying out of Jesus' prophecy. This good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. 
An obedient Christian cannot compromisingly divide his attention and time between the interests of God's kingdom and the interests of man-made kingdom and actually be putting God's kingdom first and gaining his approval. Having become aliens and temporary residents toward this old world, the Christians no longer have the right to make themselves again a part of this world. Were they to do so, then they would not be included in the prayer of that Jesus offered to God. I request you to watch over them because of the wicked one. They are no part of the world, just as I am no part of the world. Sanctify them by means of your truth. Your word is truth. There was sound reason for such a prayer, inasmuch the wicked one is the ruler of this world. Does this world of devil rule mankind love these Christian aliens and temporary residents because they consistently refuse to become a part of this world? Well, did the world love Jesus Christ because, as he said, he was no part of the world? The disciple is no better than his master. Consequently, Jesus said to his disciples, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were a part of the world, the world would be fond of what is its own. Not because you are no part of this world. But I have chosen you out of the world. On this account, the world hates you. Bear in mind the word I said to you. A slave is no greater than his master. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you also. In fact, the hour is coming when everyone that kills you will imagine he has rendered a sacred service to God. In order for the genuine Christian to enter into the fulfillment of God's promise, he has to undergo faithfully such world hatred and mistreatment. The Christianized Jews in the Roman province of Judah, and particularly to those in the capital of Jerusalem, came to know the truth of those warning words of their Messianic Master, Jesus Christ. After 28 hours, or after 28 years, after Jesus spoke the above words, the Apostle Paul, who was a Christianized Jew, was in position to write to the Hebrew believers in Jerusalem uh, these strengthened, uh, reviving words were given to them. Keep on remembering the former days in which, after you were enlightened, you endured a great conflict under suffering. Sometimes while you were being exposed as in a theater both to reproaches and tribulations, and sometimes when you became sharers with those who were having such experiences. For you both expressed sympathy for those in prison and joyfully took the plundering of your belongings knowing you yourselves have a better and enduring possession Hebrews 10 32 to 34 admittedly the world is hostile to Jehovah God and to his devoted people because of this God has assigned an ambassadorial service to his dedicated baptized worshipers who have received from him the new birth. Accordingly, he sent them forth to the alienated world, but not to sue for peace and make a compromise with the world. The doomed world is not the one to dedicate to God, a dictate to God any terms of peace. God sends forth his ambassadors to plead with individual persons of the world to take advantage of God's loving terms for entering a peaceful, life-saving relationship with him. The Christianized Jew, Paul, 
along with his half-Jewish companion, Timothy, calls this fact to our attention, saying in 2 Corinthians 5, 19-21, God was by means of Christ reconciling a world to himself, not reckoning to them their trespasses, and he committed the word of the reconciliation to us. We are therefore ambassadors substituting for Christ as though God were making entreaty through us. As substitutes for Christ, we beg, become reconciled to God. The one who did not know sin, he made to be sin for us, that we might become God's righteousness by means of him. Because of being ambassadors, substituting for Christ to all the nations, the commissioned Christians have to carry the word of the reconciliation to people of all sorts of political persuasion, to Democrats, to Republicans, to Socialists, to Nazi-minded people, to the fascist-minded, to the Communists, to the conservatives, to the labor rights, and so forth. God's word of the reconciliation is the same to all these without any partiality. For this reason, his ambassadors substituting for Christ cannot dabble in politics of any country or become members of any political party anywhere. As ambassadors for God, they are aliens and temporary residents, no matter in what land they are preaching this good news of the kingdom. Remember the Apostle Paul's words, our citizenship exists in the heavens. They appreciate that they have no right or authorization to meddle in political matters. They must remain strictly neutral toward national and local politics and all selfish conflicts of this world. So. They are the most law-abiding of people, paying taxes, and acting in the best interests of the community. Yet these ambassadors who substitute for Christ are hated by the world, just as Christ himself was. It is not strange, therefore, that just about six years after Paul wrote what is said in 2 Corinthians 5, 19-21, he found himself a prisoner in Rome, Italy, and accordingly wrote to the congregation in Ephesus, Asia Minor, to, pay, to pray for him. And he wrote, The ability to speak may be given to me with an open opening of my mouth, with all freedoms of speech to make known the sacred secret of the good news for which I am acting as an ambassador in chains. Just the same as 1900 years ago, one serving as an ambassador substituting for Christ and among the peoples today, alienated from God, calls for one to endure such suffering. As a pattern for us, Paul endured faithfully. He held on to his ambassadorship or his Christian ministry. He said, in every way, we recommend ourselves as God's ministers about the enduring of much by tribulation, by cases of need, by difficulties, by beatings, by prisons, and so forth. As a fellow sufferer, Paul could tell his Christianized Hebrew brothers to keep on enduring, just as they had endured much when they first got the light of the Bible truth. Although they might lose all earthly material possessions, yet they, and he too, had a better and an abiding possession. As ambassadors or as emissaries from God who substitute for Christ, we Christian witnesses of Jehovah today have need to develop the power of endurance, do we not? Yes, for we need to continue enduring. Since the end of the Gentile times in 1914, 
we have gone through a lot of persecution and mistreatment in the hostile world. Still more of such experiences lie ahead. They're there in front of us before we realize the fulfillment of God's promise of a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness is to dwell forever. The fulfillment of this promise is getting nearer and nearer. This generation, among which all such unrighteous persecution of God's ambassadors and emissaries has been committed since uh, World War I of 1914 to 1918 CE, is a marked generation. How so? In that it will experience God's fulfilling of his promise to bring in a righteous new system of things. So let us hold on confidently in faithful endurance. This world tries to make it hard for a person to do God's will. Yet for, a law, yet, uh, for as long as this world lasts, and that will not be much longer. We are determined to persist in doing his will. Our doing so will call for us to endure further world opposition and persecution. But God gives us his glorious promise to strengthen us and keep us enduring until his promise is fulfilled. So it remains for us to have faith in his promise, just as Abraham of ancient time did, God Almighty can supply us the needed faith, and he can supply us the power of endurance. We have his word for it in Romans 15, 4 and 5. All the things that were written aforetime were written for our instruction, that through our endurance and through the comfort from the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who supplies endurance and comfort grant you to have among yourselves the same mental attitude that Christ Jesus had, not pleasing himself, but pleasing God. The mental attitude, uh, the mental attitude of Christ Jesus leaned ever toward doing the will of God, his heavenly Father. His mental attitude inclined him to endure whatever befell him for doing God's will. Consequently, he never wavered. Never did he shrink back. The prospect of uh, undering a sacri offering a, a sacri sacrificial death as foretold for him in the scriptures written four times did not turn him aside. Uh, from doing his father's will. For enduring a martyr's death, he was rewarded with the resurrection of heavenly life. Thus he endured until the fulfillment of God's promise to him, even though he knew that this required God to perform his mightiest act in his behalf. In harmony with Christ's own case, the Apostle Paul prayed for God Almighty to supply endurance to us, Romans 15.5. This prayer will never fail as long as we persevere in doing God's will. As a reward for our enduring down to the finish, we, sh we shall receive the gladdening fulfillment of God's promise to us. May the mental attitude of Christ support us in bearing up under whatever God yet permits to come upon us from a hostile world in which we are aliens and temporary residents. Let us constantly keep in mind what is required of doers of God's will now during what is left in this time of the end. You have need of endurance in order that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the fulfillment of the promise. For yet a very little while, and he who is coming will arrive 
and will not delay. Can we endure yet a very little while longer? If we do so, then God, he who is coming, will arrive on time and fulfill his promise to us. In Hebrews 10.37, the Apostle Paul makes quotation from the inspired pre-Christian scriptures, but he does so not from the original Hebrew uh, reading, for, but from the uh, Greek translation thereof, known as the Greek Septuagint version, uh, made during the three centuries immediately before our common era. According to the Hebrew, Habakkuk 2.23 reads, and Jehovah proceeded to answer me and to say, write down the vision and set it out plainly upon tablets, in order that the one reading aloud from it may do so fluently. For the vision is yet for the appointed time, and it keeps panting on to the end, and it will not tell a lie. Even if it should delay, Keep in expectation of it, for it will without fail come true. It will not be late. However, according to the Septuagint Bible by Charles Thompson of the Septuagint Version, as published by Baxter and Sons, Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3 reads this way. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Write it distinctly in a book that the reader may trace these things, may run. For the vision is for a time yet to come. But it will spring up at last and will not be vain, though he, though he may tarry, wait for him. For he will assuredly come and will not fail and will not tarry. Thus the Septuagint version turns our attention from the version to a coming person. Also when it says, wait for him, the Greek text uses a verb that means to endure, so that the idea would be one of enduring, waiting until the coming one arrives. Likely this uses the Greek verb meaning to endure, influence the Apostle Paul to use a relative Greek noun in the preceding verse, saying, For you have need of endurance in order that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the fulfillment of the promise. The coming one who is to arrive on time is Jehovah God, then bent on executing judgment, vengeance against the oppressors of his people. His coming will also be in fulfillment of the recorded version. When or how soon is he to come as executioner? The Apostle Paul writes, Yet a very little while. Here he quotes from Haggai 2.8, which reads, This is what Jehovah of Armies has said. Yet once, it is a little while, and I am rocking the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry ground. Thus Jehovah applies to himself the time limit, a little while. And since the Apostle Paul, under inspiration, connects up this same time period, with Jehovah's coming without any delay, we can be certain that Jehovah's coming to execute judgment upon our oppressors and persecutors will now occur before not very long. What is a very little while for the eternal God? It could be a very long time for us. Nevertheless, let us ever remember where we are in the stream of time, in this time of the end. Our greatest adversary, Satan the devil, realizes that we are close to the end of this system of things, 
long under his control, inasmuch as he is the ruler of the world. He knows that now it is practically 6,000 years since he set out on his rebellious course and induced the first human parents to join him in rebellion against the universal sovereign of the Most High God. His further time for freedom of action in uh, misleading the entire inhabited earth is very near its end. After God's messianic kingdom is born in the heavens at the close of the Gentile times in 1914, Satan, the devil, and his armies, the demons, uh, were cast down in defeat from heaven to the vicinity of this earth. Then they heard the victorious cry to ring out. Now has come to pass the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. Because the accusers of our brothers have been hurled down who accused them day and night before our God. And they conquered them because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their witnessing, and they did not love their souls even in the face of death. On this account, be glad, you heavens, and you who reside in them. Woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great anger, knowing he has a short period of time. So the devil and his demons, demonic army, know that they have a short period of time since their ulcer from the holy heavens. But during this short period of time that they are able to do a lot of damage here on the earth, the woe for the earth and for the sea does not apply to the Christian brothers whom the devil and his demons have accused before our God. The woe applies to the worldlings here on land and sea. These are lying in the power of the wicked one. That woe included all the difficulties and hardships of the political, social, economic, and religious kind that Satan and his demons are causing to their great anger. Victimized humans are thereby threatened with utter destruction at the hands of the coming executioner in the great tribulation now so near for the world. Satan and his demons are bent on doing the greatest damage possible in the tiny portion of their short period of time that yet remains for them. By bringing woe on worldings who selfishly do business on land and sea, Satan, the devil, like a dragon, swallows down mankind in general to make them a part of his visible earthly organization. He keeps them so preoccupied with their selfish, materialistic pursuits due to the woe upon them that they have no time, attention, or enthusiasm for the newborn messianic kingdom of God. Very few of them make uh, or take seriously or act upon this good news of the kingdom that is being preached worldwide by Jehovah's Christian witnesses. However, Satan the devil is not satisfied with this. In his malicious desire to defeat the purpose of Jehovah God, he desperately tries to force the kingdom preachers into his camp where people will favor world domination by man-made political governments. During this short period of time allowed him, how has a dragon proceeded to do so? He does so by making war with Christ's disciples who are in line for a place with him in his heavenly kingdom of a thousand years. This warfare is not imaginary, but is real. Real is what Jehovah has said in his to the symbolic serpent in the garden of Eden after the rebellion of Adam and Eve. There Jehovah said, I shall put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you in the head and you will bruise him in the heel. 
not enmity, as persisted to this day, that original serpent, the symbolic dragon, Satan the devil, knows that God's messianic kingdom was born in the heavens in 1914, despite his efforts to prevent it. The kingdom's birth is an accomplished fact that he cannot undo. However, all during these past 19 centuries, Satan has known that Jehovah has been calling and choosing joint heirs of Christ Jesus to reign with him for a millennium. There is now left on earth just a small remnant of such prospective joint heirs of Jesus Christ. These Satan makes his target of attack. The remnant are glad with God's woman, Jehovah's heavenly organization over the birth of the kingdom seed. The remnant of Christ's prospective joint heirs are the remaining ones of the seed of God's heavenly woman. Jehovah has not made it a woeful time for the kingdom remnant yet on earth because of his having the dragon and his demon angels hurled down from heaven on earth. Rather, he has made this time of the end an increasing blessed time for the kingdom remnant. The spiritual blessedness counteracts the woe that afflicts, afflicts those under the devil's rulership. But Satan, the devil, tries to wreck the blessedness of the remnant of the kingdom seed. He is still bent on trying to defeat God's purpose to have 144,000 joint heirs of Christ. Desperately, he still tries to prevent the remnant from proving worthy of a share in the kingdom. How? Revelation 12, 17 tells how. It tells what the dragon, Satan, the devil, and his demon angels do after being dislodged from heaven, namely. And the dragon grew wrathful at the woman and went off to wage war with the remaining ones of her seed, who observe the commandments of God and have the work of bearing witness to Jesus. The symbolic dragon and his demon, angel, had battled unsuccessfully to maintain their position in the holy heavens after the birth of God's messianic kingdom in 1914. So now, uh, during their detention here in the neighborhood of our earth, they spitefully direct their warfare against those on earth who are called to the messianic kingdom against which they battled up in heaven. This is really a hot war. It has already cost the lives of many hundreds of Christian Jehovah's Witnesses in violent death, both among the remaining ones of Christ prospective joint heirs and among the great crowd of those who are preparing now to be earthly subjects of Christ's thousand-year kingdom. Unitedly, the kingdom remnant and the great crowd engage in doing the will of God by observing his commandments and carrying out the work of bearing witness to Christ. They bear witness to Jesus as being now enthroned in heaven and making ready to put an end to the dragon's warfare against his faithful disciples by destroying, destroying all of the dragon's earthly agents and thereafter binding and imprisoning him and his demon angels for a thousand years of this peace-bringing reign. To those who are doers of God's will on earth, to the end his promise will be fulfilled. The dragon's all-out effort to keep the remnant from gaining entrance into the heavenly kingdom are doomed to failure. Revelation 24 to 6 assures us that uh, these doers of God's will who are yet needed to complete the full membership of 144,000 joint heirs, will endure in faithfulness to the death that they may know the happiness 
of having a part in the first resurrection. Jehovah's Messianic Kingdom will not be lacking, lacking even one of these four ordained numbers of Christ joint heirs. As for the great crowd of the prospective earthly subjects of Christ's kingdom, these give loyal cooperation and support to the kingdom remnant in their endeavors to do the will of God to the finish. They courageously join the remnant in doing the divine will down till the universal sovereignty of Jehovah God is vindicated. To this faithful, obedient, great crowd, God's promise of a paradise earthly home will without fail be fulfilled. Unspeakable joy will be theirs when they hear the reigning Son of God extend to them his loving invitation. Come, you who have been blessed of my Father, inherit the earthly realm of the kingdom prepared for you from the founding of the world. The short period of time during which Satan, the uh, devil, and his demon army are restrained here on the earth is now uh, nearing its close. He may therefore be expected to intensify his warfare against the remaining ones of the seed of God's heavenly woman and against the great crowd of fellow proclaimers of God's messianic kingdom. So it becomes all the more urgent for these doers of God's will to exercise faith in order to endure faithfully under the fire of the enemy. All we who are now the target of Satan's warfare are given much encouragement to remain faithful to the Sovereign Lord Jehovah until the enemy's guns are silenced. This bringing of the warfare to a close should reasonably be near, especially since it is now more than 56 years since the symbolic dragon and his demon armies were hurled down from heaven to the neighborhood of the earth to be left here on the loose for, for only a short period of time. In spite of the shortness of the time, we still must follow the counsel of the Apostle Paul written in Hebrews 10, 36 to 37. You, you have need of endurance in order that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the fulfillment of the promise. For yet a very little while, and he who is coming will arrive and will not delay. According to those quotations from the Apostle Paul, from Habakkuk 2.3 and Haggai 2.6, Jehovah is he who is coming and will arrive and will not delay. As an invincible warrior, he will gain the victory over those who wage war against his long harassed worshipers. By his glorious victory in the war of the day of God the Almighty at Armageddon, he will vindicate his promise to bring lasting benefit to his afflicted worshipers. The dragon, Satan, the devil, and his demon's army have been uh, restrained uh, from materializing visibly in the flesh in order to wage war on Jehovah's Christian witnesses of the day. Hence, they are obliged to use earthly agents under their unseen control, worldly persons, organizations, and political governments. The political elements that are involved in the warfare make up the worldwide political system that Revelation 13, 1-10 pictures as a ferocious wild beast. This includes the modern Anglo-American dual world power, the seventh world power spoken of in the Bible prophecy. 
In fulfillment of Bible prophecy, this seventh world power promotes the creation of an idolatrous image of the political wild beast. For more than 56 years now, the image has attracted the attention of the world. The image is the International Organization for World Peace and Security. Sovereignty and uh, man-made forms of political rulership over all the earth really worship the political wild beast. They also trust in the image of that wild beast rather than in Jehovah's sovereign rulership by Christ. Nationalistically, they lend hand and head the support of these man-made arrangements for world domination. This results in their getting the mark that plainly shows that they are serving not the interests of God's kingdom, but those of self-governing mankind. They are not ashamed to be connected with the meaningful number 660 and 6, the identifying number of the political wild beast. In the Bible, six is a number used to signify human imperfection, human shortcoming, and 600 plus 60 plus 6 denotes human imperfection and deficiency in an intensified way, particularly in human rulership of the earth. Today we can see more clearly than ever before the frustrating failure of man's political rulership because of its imperfection, inadequacy, and its corruptness. It is found wanting before God. Patrioteers who worship the wild beast and its image proudly wear the number of its name, 666. They put pressure upon everybody else to force them to join in worshiping the wild beast and thereby getting marked as belonging to the man-made political state, not God, not to God. They resort to persecution of various kinds against Jehovah's Christian witnesses. Why? Because these refuse to take part in the idolatrous worship of man-made creations. These pose to serve tests of faithfulness for all who uphold Jehovah's universal sovereignty and Godship. That is why the angel seen by the Apostle John's version said, Here is where it means endurance for the Holy Ones, those who observe the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus. We who observe God's commandments obey him as ruler rather than men, even at the cost of suffering at the hands of persecutors. We hold on to our faith in Jesus as the Messiah or Christ and advertise him as the anointed king whom Jehovah has enthroned and crowned at the expiration of the Gentile times in 1914. For this vital reason, we abstain from taking any active part in the politics and violent controversies of the wild beast and of the Anglo-American dual world power, the promoter of the image of the wild beast from the post-war period of 1919 onward. We are not ignorant of what it would mean for us to get the mark, the name of the wild beast or its number of its name, it would mean for us to drink of the wine of the anger of God that is poured out undiluted into the cup of his wrath and to be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels, in the sight of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. This would lead to our everlasting destruction, the second death. It would be plunged into the symbolic fiery lake that burns with fire. Do we want that to occur to us? No. The present situation 
where extreme nationalism and the worship of the political state has spread worldwide indeed called for endurance on the part of those who observe the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. But our steadfast obedience to God's commandments and the faith of Jesus is what now constitutes the will of God. It is only after we have done the will of God in this respect that we shall receive the fulfillment of his promise to us. Inasmuch as it is now but a very little while before, the, before he who is coming will arrive and will not delay, it would be foolish in itself for us to stop enduring so as to get selfish relief for ourselves before Jehovah arrives with vengeance against those who make it so hard for us to do his will faithfully again. But the thing promised to us by God serves as an incentive to us to continue doing God's will out of love for him. The thing promised is held out for us. But we need to exercise strong faith in the promiser, believing that he is absolutely faithful to his promise, as well as being able to fulfill it to us. Do we have such faith? We need it to make us strong to endure until the fulfillment of God's promise. Such faith is our, on our part, honors God, for it demonstrates that we trust in him with respect to trueness to his promise. So our faith in God is something pleasing to him. He is happy to reward such an enduring faith. In reminding us of how essential faith is to our maintaining Christian integrity and proving worthy to eternal life in the promised new order of righteousness, the Apostle Paul quotes a further statement by God in the prophecy of Habakkuk. In that prophecy, God first speaks of the one who is swelled up with pride, self-importance self-confidence, having no faith in Jehovah. So this one is not an upright soul, not upright for the one true and living God. After taking note of such a soul, Jehovah makes the statement that is quoted by Paul, but my righteous one will live by reason of faith. Such faith induces the righteous one to be faithful, upright. Of course, in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says, we are walking by faith, not by sight. And this means that we are living with faith toward God. However, in order to endure the and gain eternal life in fulfillment of God's promise, we have to exercise faith down to the finish of our life in this wicked system of things of which Satan the devil is ruler. We need to display the same degree of faith that was displayed by faithful men of old time. They proved their faith down to the very death, even though they did not receive the fulfillment of the particular promise made to them. Their exemplary exploits of faith, the Apostle Paul briefly describes in the following chapter of his letter, Hebrews chapter 11. From his account of so many men of, and women of faith who had a commendable witness borne to them by God, Paul pleads us uh, to the greatest example by, uh, to the greatest example of faith saying, or rather, Paul leads us to the greatest example of faith, saying, So then, 
because we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also put off every weight and the sin that easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. As we look at the chief agent and perfecter of our faith, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, he endured a torture stake, despising shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now especially it behooves us to look intently at our perfect exemplar, Jesus Christ. And by this time, he not only sits at the right hand of the throne of God, but also reigns as the installed messianic king, even during this very little while that is rapidly terminating before Jehovah arrives as avenger, it is possible for us to lose faith, committing the sin that so easily entangles us. Nineteen centuries ago, Paul took occasion to warn the Christianized Hebrews of such a danger by adding the further quotation from Habakkuk's prophet saying, And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Habakkuk 10.38 In Habakkuk's prophecy, according to the early Greek Septuagint, the Septuagint uh, Jehovah says, if uh, anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But the just shall live by faith in me. The one losing faith and drawing back gains Jehovah's displeasure. This one is contrasted with the Christian who holds fast his faith in Jehovah and gains eternal life. In making his quotation, Paul reverses the order of the two parts of Habakkuk 2.4. Paul puts the last part first. Paul does this in order to caution us to have the Christian faith for the time being. And even now there is a danger of some of us the shrinking back or falling away. Consequently, let him that thinks he is standing beware that he does not fall. As the world under Satan gets more dictatorial, the pressure upon us increases. As we see the tremendous final test of our faithfulness looming up before us at the approach of the Great Tribulation, we might decide not to face it. We might lose faith and confidence in God. So we shrink back. We cease to endure the trial. Quite appropriate, the Latin Vulgate version of Habakkuk 2.4 reads, Behold, he that is unbelieving, his soul shall not be right in himself, but the just shall live by faith. The uh, Roman Catholic uh, New American Bible indicates that the Christian is rash in giving up his faith because of the mounting difficulties that he sees just ahead. So that he breaks his integrity toward God. It reads, The rash man has no integrity, but the just man, because of his faith, shall live. The Christian who marches right on in faith toward the Great Tribulation is not rash in doing so. The real rash one, the person swollen up with self-confidence, is the one through disbelief 
or God Almighty becomes a quitter. The quitter stops short of the reward. The uh, fulfillment of God's purpose is to the faithful. Jehovah God has no pleasure in quitters. Faced now with the most uh, turbulent time in all the history of Jehovah's devoted people, what shall we do? What should be our determination? Far be it from us to take the cowardly course and shrink back. By God's undeserved kindness, our rightful course is, is set for us by the Apostle Paul, for he speaks the, the faithful class, speaks for the first faithful class and says, at he is 1039, now we are not the sort that shrink, that shrink back to destruction, but we are the sort that have faith to the preserving alive of the soul. Now is the time for us to make up our minds. We are going to rest unwaveringly faith in God and to agree with the Apostle Paul and declare with decisiveness, we are not the sort to shrink back to destruction. Declaring ourselves to be not of that sort of uh, unbelieving Christians, we shall not forsake the gathering of ourselves together, as the shrinking unbelievers have the custom. But we shall, even in underground places if necessary, gather together in order to encourage one another. And all the more so as we behold the day drawing near. We should not throw away our freeness of speech which has a great reward to be paid for it. But we shall boldly keep on proclaiming Jehovah's theocratic government by Christ as the one and only hope for all mankind. In contrast with destruction, eternal life is what we want, is it not? So speaking now, not negatively, but positively, we wholeheartedly say we are the sort that have faith to the preserving alive of the soul. Faith is the assured expectation of things hoped for, the evident demonstration of realities do not be held, but by means of this a man, the men of old times, including Abraham, had witness born to them. Our faith in the promise of God, for whom lying is an impossibility, empowers us to endure. Faith and endurance go together as it is written in Revelation 13.10. Here is where it means the endurance and faith of the Holy Ones. Till now, we may have endured a long time for the promise of God to be fulfilled. But our expectation of it is a fortified, assured one, an expectation to the point where we are absolutely confident that Jehovah God will not disappoint us. The things promised by God and for which we hope we uh, may not yet see. But we know that they are realities for as much we have, as much we do have the evident demonstration of their existence according to the Almighty God's power. In order to enter into the fulfillment of God's promise, we must possess life. We need to have our souls preserved alive. 
we can gain the prize of life solely by a sustained faith. We eagerly desire to enjoy God's fulfilled promise eternally. Away then with any thought or inclination to shrink back in fear and in unbelief. Faith is what we will exercise along with works in proof. In reward for that, Jehovah God, the life giver, will preserve our souls alive forever. Without fail, therefore, the God who supplies endurance will fulfill his promise to the faithful enduring doers of his will. Joyfully, he will usher us into the eternal blessings and privileges of his long promised kingdom by his Son, Jesus Christ. Thus, not in vain, shall we have preached this kingdom in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations before the end comes. meeting of the Wapstar Bible and Tract Society. It certainly has been a <coughs> pleasure to be with you. As you uh, know, I've had an illness, but uh, I'm getting along all right. Every once in a while, people call up Bethel and tell us they heard Brother Nor died, but I got through this morning. <laughs> and I'd just like to uh, express to uh, <coughs> all of your brothers uh, the interest in me that, and the prayers that you have offered to Jehovah God and your good wishes and uh, your fine uh, comments that you've uh, written to me. It's all been uh, very upbuilding and encouraging and I know the prayers of the righteous avail much and uh, I have accounted on those prayers, and I'm still going strong. I work every day. There's a little tumor here in the brain, which the doctors are treating, and uh, whatever comes uh, one way or the other, uh, I'm very happy to keep on living and serving with you brothers, but uh, if there's three score and ten and a couple of more years after that, uh, things to the health of the body and its use, uh, I'm looking forward to something much better, but it has been uh, But it has been uh, wonderful to work with you all these years, and I enjoyed it tremendously. And I'm very grateful to Joe that I could come to this meeting and be with you. <laughs> so I do appreciate very much your prayers and your love and it has really buoyed me up. But uh, the brothers at Bethel and the doctors have taken very wonderful care. 
and I appreciate their love, the love of the governing body, all of you members, and all of my brothers worldwide. So now we come to the close of the annual meeting, and uh, there are going to be some refreshments served, and Brother Dawson will come on the platform after we close with prayer and uh, tell you how the arrangement will be made for eating. And then at 1.30 this afternoon, there will be another session, which I'm sure you will enjoy to the full. We have uh, many brothers from the different branches that uh, Brother Suter will introduce. He will be the chairman this afternoon. And there will be brothers here from the governing body who will speak, I understand. So I'm going to enjoy myself down here, listening to those up here. So let us now adjourn uh, this meeting until next year, Jehovah willing, that we meet again uh, with a word of prayer.